You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Welcome to Convenience Matters. I'm your host, Donovan Woods, with the Fuels Institute, and I'm here with my co-host, Stephanie Sikorsky, Vice President of Marketing for Nax. Stephanie, you know, we have a great topic today, one of my favorite topics to go into, and that is urban planning, urban design. And really, what role do fuel retailers and those who are the transportation stakeholders, what role do they play? And to get us into that discussion, we're inviting a guest we've had on our show before and was a very well-received podcast, and that is Miss Becky Steckler of Urbanism Next. She's the program director at the Sustainable Cities Initiative, University of Oregon. Becky, welcome back. Thank you so much. I am excited about this because, again, I enjoy your company personally, as well as uh, you were at our conference a while back. And I think the last conversation we had was one that really got me thinking again about what is going to happen in the future. People think about it, people talk about it, but what's interesting about what you do, especially at Urbanism Next, you actually are doing it. You're planning it. You're setting the standards for that. So anything new that's happened in the last year that maybe you want to talk about? I'm sure there's only been like one or two things. (laughs) We've been very, very busy. Uh, It's been fascinating to talk to cities all across the country and actually uh, my boss, Uh, is on sabbatical in Europe, and so he's been talking to people all across Europe. Uh, And and folks are really starting to understand that new mobility, everything from e-scooters and dockless bikes to eventually autonomous vehicles, um, are potentially really going to change the way both people and goods move. And so that's really what we do at the University of Oregon um, at Urbanism Next. Uh, We are studying how autonomous vehicles, e-commerce, and the sharing economy are impacting city form development. So we're not spending so much time on the technology itself, but really more on, uh, you know, what does this mean for cities? And so more and more, I'm getting, uh, you know, interest from, you know, transportation uh, planners, as well as elected officials saying, you know, what do we need to do to be prepared for autonomous vehicles? And then you start having the conversation about all the other modes as well. So, Becky, I have a quick question. You mentioned about you all being across Europe right now and and having those discussions. And I recently came across an article that was talking about cities with the most innovative transportation futures. And no surprise probably is that Berlin and London, among others, rank at the top. So is that part of the reason for going over there? Is that really where we should be looking in terms of best practices and bringing home? Well, you know, it's... um It's interesting to see what they are doing, and I would say part of that is because of the density of so many of their cities. They were just they were just developed before the car became, you know, just so ubiquitous. Uh, And it's really different than how we designed our cities in the United States. Uh, You know, it's it's much easier to get around by car, and so all these different modes. you know, whether it's, again, the scooters or even transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft uh, have definitely, you know, to a certain extent, and I'm not as familiar with all the different ways that they're, they're moving around, uh, but there's, there's some kind of really interesting ways, and I would say that people are used to getting around without a car, so it makes it maybe just a little bit easier than to attract kind of new customers to these new mobility services. So, but there's some really interesting stuff I would say going on even in North America, uh, and you know, and in probably our large cities. So, San Francisco, New York, Washington D.C., Miami, Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, and a little bit. I'm in Portland, Oregon, so I'm I'm seeing this here as well. But it's really in the largest cities that we're seeing some of the um, uh, some of the more innovative uh, uh, policies, as well as you know, really seeing uh, you know this kind of influx of new services. And, and really new ideas. So among those transportation leaders, and I think for those of us that are listening and certainly the big cities, we we can get it in terms of it being more congested. There might be more that we're having to deal with in terms of air pollution, certainly the crowded roads. What is it about one or two of those that kind of brings it to that next level? Is it the all of the above in terms of the the policies, like you said, what they're trying to do for maybe more clean air and just the different mm-hmm. modes of transportation, or is there something that's unifying across all of them? 
Uh, you know, I would say that uh, part of it is this: the cities are, are starting to get almost like a better picture. Uh, many of them were kind of surprised or, or caught off guard with the introduction of Uber and Lyft and definitely the e-scooters. That, that was probably a really good example of one day there's, you know, thousands of scooters on your city streets. And there's no or next to parkways Correct. <laughs> in the middle of the grass. Exactly, exactly. And so um, so it's been interesting because, you know, when I talk to transportation planners and they're saying, you know, we thought, you know, we'd have to have one set of regulations for Uber and Lyft and we'd have to have a different one for our scooters and a different one for bikes. But really there's some underlying, almost like the policy uh, you know, standards that really apply across all those different modes. So if, if you're purchasing transportation, then there's certain things that cities are really starting to pay attention to. And it's everything from, uh, you know, really thinking about their, their city goals. And so again, this, this is going to look different, you know, depending on what those goals are, but, you know, really thinking about safety. Are we making sure that all users of the transportation system are safe? So if you've got a vision zero, you know, and your goal is really to eliminate um, deaths and serious injuries, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, how are, how are all these people that are dropping folks off and maybe going across a bike lane or, you know, near sidewalks? Uh, you know, how, do, how do all the different modes, are we reducing conflicts or increasing conflicts? And so how can we try to mitigate that? Um, to, you know, supporting, you know, a lot of cities have very strong active transportation, the bike walk and transit. Well, you know, yeah. Becky. <laughs> did I get all three? You, you did, you did, um, you did. Yeah, to really thinking about, you know, what is the impact on the overall transportation system? Should we re- be requiring information from these companies, you know, suddenly this technology makes it potentially easier to collect information, have a better understanding of how many people are getting, you know, dropped off in certain locations. Do we have hot spots? You know, do we then start to think about design to make it all flow a lot better? Um, and if we're starting to get, you know, a lot of demand at the curb uh, for both, you know, passengers as well as goods being delivered, then, um, you know, having that information is going to make it much easier to, you know, improve the flow and, uh, and, and really, you know, make our cities function and make it much easier for people and goods to move around. So, so they're starting to think, I would say, much more holistically, you know, this year than maybe even they did, um, you know, roughly a year ago, and really thinking about all of those services kind of more comprehensively. You know, Becky, <clears throat> You're at the University of Oregon. Um, be- mm-hmm. Before I ask the question, just for our audience, what is the relationship between the University of Oregon and uh, Urbanism Next? Oh, so the uh, uh, Urbanism Next Center is uh, it's, it's kind of nested in the um, Sustainable Cities uh, Initiative, which is part of our College of Design. So the College of Design uh, at the University of Oregon is, uh, you know, architecture and landscape architecture, planning, public policy, uh, you know, it's really thinking kind of about that built environment. And so we are, we're a, a center within the university. Okay. So, and it's great because one of the things we do too is that we really try to leverage the resources of the entire u- university. So not only are we looking at our built, uh, built environment professionals, but we also regularly work with our law school or work with um, uh, the business school or even the school of journalism. So we're really bringing folks in from all these different professions to think more holistically about, you know, what, is, what do all these changes mean? Okay. All right. With that, that last part, especially when you talked about holistically and bringing in different uh, segments of the university, you have a conference each year in May or in the spring, uh, National Urbanism Next Conference. The people that attend that, would it ever be a place for someone that say is their fuel retailer, whether it's someone within the marketing team or uh, design team, whatever it may be, does it fit? How can those two entities get to talk to each other? Because I feel that retailers are everywhere. We're throughout mm-hmm. all parts of the city as well as in suburbs. So we have to be a part of the plan. Should we be a part of the discussion? Uh, absolutely. I think this is a great place to really understand uh, the kinds of policies that cities are really grappling with. And so, you know, if, if you've got a, a business, you've got a development, and you want to understand kind of how things might change around you and how that environment might change and, and policies that cities might adopt it are going to affect your business, then this is definitely a great place to come to just learn more about that. So it could be everything from, uh, you know, what about curb policies or parking policies? And, you know, how could that 
change or, or what kinds of you know, opportunities are there. Um, especially if you've got some big parking lots, then you know, I'm starting to hear folks talking about how could we potentially redevelop um, some of those, uh, that land for you know, kind of more intensive uses. You know, should you be maybe putting more commercial uh, you know, businesses there or maybe even housing? Um, you know, what, what could we potentially do with that land? So um, this, the conference itself is a partnership with the American Institutes of Architects, uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the American Planning Association, and the Urban Land Institute, so developers, architects, you know, planners. Uh, so, so we're primarily focusing on the built environment professionals, but it's a great place just to learn about, you know, what cities, from around the country to around the world are starting to think about how they're going to address uh, these changes in transportation. So a lot of good points there. How does a retailer get connected? Is it a direct contact through yourself or are there contacts like yourself across the U.S. to where we could point those that are interested? Uh, yeah, I would definitely suggest checking out our website, uh, urbanismnext.com, and so we have a lot of information. As the, there, we have a lot of information there as well, uh, and definitely information about the conference. And uh, soon we'll have the um, the whole schedule up, and so you can see the types of, of sessions that we're going to have. Uh, but just about any city, and definitely larger cities across the country, are uh, their transportation departments are starting to think about you know, kind of new policies and how they address these issues. And a lot of cities are actually creating, you know, innovation departments that maybe are in a mayor's office or, you know, in some other kind of location, but they're starting to think much more proactively about, you know, kind of the information and these emerging technologies because they're they're happening so much faster than most cities can respond. And so I think there's a little bit of a fear that, you know, they'll, they'll come up with some kind of regulatory framework but it really will be outdated by the time they adopt it because, you know, those processes can, can take, you know, a year or two or sometimes even longer. So, uh, you know, they're trying to be much more nimble and adaptive and, you know, be able to respond because, of course, they want to make sure their residents can move around as well as businesses can have access to the goods and the employees that they need. Well, and you bring up a great point about the innovation departments, and I love that we're talking about that here. It's certainly a dialogue that we've had at NACS and with the Fuels Institute. I don't know how you can't have that on an agenda pretty much for any conference now. And we were talking recently about the future of convenience and what that looks like, and everything is one click away. We know that in some cases, one Mm -hmm. click away almost seems like too many clicks. So if you have the volume of deliveries that are increasing and we see that across, not just with Amazon, but others that are in that business and moving less from the the bricks and mortar to clicks, how's that Mm -hmm. impacting design? How are you all talking about that? Well, you know, it's it's fascinating, and I can't help but think uh, about uh, my experience, gosh, back in September of 2017. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. at a conference and walking down the street, and, uh, you know, in front of me is uh, Starship, which has these terrestrial drones. So, it's, you know, it's about the size of a cardboard box on wheels going down the sidewalk. And, uh, and I'm getting out my phone because I'm, no, I'm like, you know, this is definitely going in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, taking pictures of it, and asking the gentleman that was walking behind it, I'm like, you know, what are you doing? And uh, he's like, you know, we're, we're, it's a pilot project, we're, uh, you know, uh, making a delivery. And so I'm like, well, what are you delivering? And he's like, well, you know, we're, we're making a Chipotle delivery. So I, I saw the future of burrito delivery <laughs> on the sidewalk. And so, and of course, for me, it brought up all sorts of, you know, interesting questions of everything from, you know, what's, what's it going to feel like to walk down the street if there's 10 more of these drones? You know, it's, it's lunchtime and everybody's ordered their lunch. And so now suddenly there's, there's all these drones. And I know there's grocery delivery. Uh, Lord knows what sometimes when I'm cooking at home and, you know, and I'm, I'm out of eggs or out of one ingredient, you know, am I going to just, you know, press a button and then have it delivered within 15 minutes or, or something like that. Like I, I can really envision that kind of a change. And so, you know, and that's just one kind of delivery. Like what is that going to look like uh, on our streets is maybe we get more and more of these, you know, drones that are moving around slow speed, but potentially on our sidewalks or on our streets. Um, so it's, uh, definitely kind of a, a brave new world. 
we spend a lot of time thinking about passengers, and I think we've spent less time thinking about the goods movement and uh, that that demand for, you know, not just two-day, but eventually two-hour delivery window and the importance of having those goods close to uh, to customers. And so, you know, what is – and it's an area that I really want to do more research around to better understand, you know, what could that – what could that future look like? That's different. I, I don't think I've ever seen that in D.C. myself, seen someone deliver a, a, a burrito, but I think that's probably because I'm already there <laughs> getting my you know burrito or my I was going to say, imagine mm. how fast you could get your Chick-fil-A, Donovan. I don't know if I can get it any faster in my stomach. <laughs> it's it's uh, I think I sleep with that stuff. So uh, I will be remiss if I didn't ask this question, Becky. Um, last month, what is this, in early 2019, uh, there mm-hmm. was a regulation at least put out there in Oregon in terms of regulating uh, transport, their TNCs, uh, basically your ride mm-hmm. shares, your Lyft, your Ubers. Where does that stand? And, and really, why is that something that's important to uh, what you do at Urbanism Next, whatever that ends up yeah. being? Well, you know, uh, Oregon is the only state in the country that does not have a statewide uh, TNC regulation. And you see a really wide range, and it, it makes some sense from a company level. It's much easier to work on a state-by-state state basis. There's 50 states in the U.S., um, as opposed to a city-by-city. City. And, of course, there's thousands of cities across the, the state. So even in Oregon, um, and I'm not exactly sure how many cities have TNCs today, but it's, it's quite a few. And so they're, they're negotiating. You know, each city has their own in or well, Many cities in Oregon have their own kind of TNC regulations. So if you want to operate, you have to apply for a separate operating permit. And each one of those has their own requirements. And so I know there's been a push to, um, to standardize that. Uh, and we'll see. It's early in the legislative process. So I'm not sure where that will end up by the end of the session. Uh, but it's definitely something that we're watching. Okay. Okay. And just for our audience, TNCs, am I correct, transportation network companies? Correct. Okay, perfect. And again, those are like your Ubers and your Lyfts. And I guess having regulation would be a good thing. And I'm, I'm surprised that that didn't start off out there in the West Coast and move towards East. So that's, that's a bit of a surprise. And I know, again, just to clarify, you're with University of Oregon. And a lot of mm-hmm. times when people think about, at least from the East Coast, my perspective has always been things happen that are going to be the future starting from the West and they move East. Are you seeing um, the same things out here in the D.C. area, in the New York area, in the Charlottes, the bigger cities on the East Coast? Are you seeing the same type of innovation, um, the discussion happening? Is it happening at the same pace it's happening out where you are in the Pacific Northwest? You know, I would definitely say the different regions almost have their own flavor. And some of it is in, you know, kind of in response to what is currently happening. So, uh, you know, we've been uh, paying attention to, you know, some of the efforts to relieve the pressure at the curb. So New York City uh, has, you know, historically done some additional work really thinking about deliveries uh, and and how they can, you know, keep traffic moving and, and keep trucks and deliveries moving. Uh, some with more success and maybe some with a little less success. In Washington, D.C., I know they've also been uh, uh, um, experimenting a little bit uh, with uh, the drop-off and pickup, especially around nightlife, bars and restaurants. And so replacing some of those parking spaces with drop-off and and pickup zones. And I would say uh, San Francisco has been doing that as well. So where where they've seen more congestion and, and more issues is kind of usually where they start to tackle it first. Uh, we just um, are wrapping up uh, right now a project with the cities of Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, British Columbia, thinking about the impact of autonomous vehicles on the city's abilities to implement their climate action plans. So, you know, what are the opportunities and threats from AVs for greenhouse gas emissions? So kind of more of that environmental feel, uh, you know, from the Pacific Northwest is definitely something that they're thinking about. But they're also thinking about kind of the efficiencies of the systems and and how can they make sure this new mobility um, supports the uh, uh, investments that all three cities have made in the whole transit system, as well as you know, trying to make people healthier by giving them some really great opportunities to walk and bike. So, uh, you know, and I would say in, in Los Angeles, it seems like they're really thinking about how can they move people more efficiently with real-time management of information. So uh, it, it's been fascinating to kind of watch some of those efforts to really think about, you know, really harnessing the technology to make everything move much more smoothly. 
So, uh, and, and it's all in the early stages. Everybody's experimenting and trying different things out. And, uh, I, you know, in the planning field, we often think of best practices for different types of, of policies. But right now, I would call most of them promising practices. But we're still kind of working out the kinks. And, and, and the technology, honestly, is just still changing so fast right, right. that even if we create one thing for, for this, uh, uh, experience that it changes a year later and, and you've got to, you know, come up with something a little bit newer. So, uh, it's fascinating. That's really, really interesting. Well, you know, no matter what, whether, um, whether you're a retailer, whether you're an OEM, uh, whether you're just someone in your own neighborhood, keeping aware of what's happening, the change that's happening is important. And you mentioned autonomous vehicles and we've seen things where there have been um, some mishaps in the last two years or so um, in some major cities, but in comparison to the amount of fatalities that happen with just a human driver, they can't compare. But right. if we are retail, I would assume you would suggest that we just continue to actually get more involved, know what something like Urbanism Next is doing, uh, making sure that we are a part of the discussion instead of letting things plan around us and we look around and we're kind of zoned out of the area. Absolutely. Pay attention to it all. And uh, I think especially when it comes to the whole distribution network for goods, uh, there's probably, you know, some real opportunities there to think about, especially so many of the retailers I know that, that you work with um, are in neighborhoods and they're, you know, kind of spread across. Uh, metropolitan areas and so they're probably very well positioned to be part of that distribution chain. Well and I think that's one area to watch for us as we move forward. Yes, I agree. Well thank you Becky, I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing what's happening in the future and we'll keep in touch and we thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information visit convenience.org.